Hey guys! In this video we'll cover overclocking on the Ryzen 5000 series chips, more specifically the 6-core Ryzen 5 5600X and the 16-core Ryzen 9 5950X. Let's dive right in. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. Let me quickly share some results of overclocking the 5600X and 5950X before I go deeper and share with you my methods of how I chose to do it. In Cinebench R20 single core scores, we got about 6% more improvement from Ryzen 5 and lost about 4% performance on the Ryzen 9. This is almost perfect scaling when compared to the overclock amount. And in the multi-core test, we've seen 11% improvement on the Ryzen 5, making it the same performance as the 8-core Intel 10700K, while Ryzen 9 gets an incredible 18% bump as it is no longer throttling down. These chips are very much temperature limited. At the moment, we're using a 240ml liquid oil mode cooler with ambient temperature being 27 degrees. So if we had a better cooling system, then I feel we could push another 5200 MHz. If you're interested in getting this kind of performance, stick around as you may learn a thing or two. I want to highlight a very important point. Any kind of overclocking is not covered by warranty. And for someone who is not experienced in overclocking, there is a very good chance of breaking things. So don't attempt this unless you are fully aware of the risks involved, as you may damage your CPU or worse. There are a few different avenues you can choose for overclocking. I will briefly go over several of them, starting with the Precision Boost Overdrive, or PBO for short. It is an extension of AMD's Precision Boost, which manages the clock speed based on different workloads. With PPO, you are able to adjust parameters like package power target, thermal design current and electric design current. After raising these parameters, the chip is giving more headroom to push its performance. While it's not going to boost past max boost clock, it will allow it to boost more often, providing it's staying under its other limits such as temperatures. This is almost an effortless tweak and results can be a very much hit and miss. Another method of overclocking is using tools like Auto OC. In this example, even motherboard or software will automatically tweak the key parameters like voltages to get the most out of the CPU. Generally, this provides a small amount of improvement and there is a potential of overriding boost by up to 200 MHz with very low effort. Personally, I never really had good experience with this. Next method is manual adjustments using Ryzen Master. And here you can control per CCX clock speeds, peak and actual voltages, overclock and configure memory as well as infinity fabric speed. The nice thing about using Ryzen Master is the ability to tweak without restarting the system as you can run some of the quick tests within the software. On the other hand, if you go a bit too far with your tweaks, you may end up crashing your PC and actually not being able to boot. You will need to then default the BIOS and start from scratch. It is very beneficial to have motherboards with BIOS reset buttons so you can quickly recover. Alternatively, most motherboards have a more hands-on process to reset the BIOS, so please check the manual. A more old school type of overclocking is tweaking the settings through BIOS. This is my preferred way, but it is also more time consuming, as you need to make the changes, boot into your OS, test for stability and performance, check if it's okay, if not, restart, make the changes, test and repeat. With Zen 2 last year, there have been so many days spent optimizing, literally pulling out my hair, just to finally realize that the stock performance is actually good enough. Another thing to note, when you do manual overclocking, you lose automatic boost. With Zen 2, you had to choose either leaving your CPU at stock to have great single thread performance from boost or improve all core performance by overclocking. Unfortunately, all core overclock is normally lower than the maximum boost speed, so you will certainly make sacrifices. Zen 3, on the other hand, seems to have much higher overclocking headroom. On a smaller 6 core 5600X, we've managed to overclock it to 4.85 GHz, which is 250 MHz above maximum boost clock across all cores, improving both single core and multi threaded performance. On the 16 core 5950X, we were able to overclock to 4.7 GHz, which is 200 MHz short from the max boost clock. If you remember the last generation, 3950X could only go as far as 4.3 GHz, so this is not bad at all. Do bear in mind that every CPU is different, some will overclock better than others. So how do we get here? We've overclocked through BIOS, and I'll repeat myself again, but this is very important. Tinkering with overclocking avoids your warranty, so do it at your own risk. Back to it. First, boot into BIOS, and here you can turn on DOCP to overclock your RAM straight away. Then scroll down to CPU core ratio and set your multiplier. 
I would recommend starting at 4.6 GHz for the smaller core CPUs like Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 and 4.5 GHz for the Ryzen 9. After that's done, head down to voltages and set CPU core voltage to manual, then change it to 1.3 volts to start with. Then go to VRM control. In Asus Mobile Board, it's called external DG plus power control. Here on the CPU load line calibration set it to level three. Load line calibration helps you apply more voltage while CPU is under heavy load, which in turn provides better stability. Otherwise, when you're doing intensive tasks, your voltage level will drop and you will likely experience a crash. A thing to consider, the higher the overclock, the more voltage you will need, which produces higher temperatures. So it's paramount to have good cooling system. Now the settings are ready, we can boot into the windows. I do my initial testing in Cinebench R20 using multi-threaded test and recommend installing hardware monitoring tool. We use hardware info to track temperatures and voltages. If it runs smoothly three times in a row, then I feel comfortable to say it's draft stable and we'll try to push it further. I'll go back into BIOS, up the frequency by 25 or 50, leave the rest as is and test again. If during the next run, the temperatures do not reach 90 degrees, but it crashes, then it's likely that the voltage is too low. I would then go and increase it by one step, which is about 0.125 volts, and then try again. If on the other hand, you're hitting thermal limits, then bring back the frequency and also lower the voltage by one step. Tweak like this until you find the best balance. Pro tip, for stability, find your sweet spot and then turn it down a notch. We've already showed the benchmark results in Cinebench, and those were pretty good. To verify, we've also ran Blender benchmark, both BMW and Classroom test. Here we found similar results, but we'll focus on the Classroom test as it is longer and has better indication long-term performance. Ryzen 5 has about 7.5% improvement while overclocked, and Ryzen 9 has completed the test about 13.5% faster. For stability reasons, we had to turn down our overclocks to stay within the thermal limits. And let me tell you, these chips definitely having a workout here. Ryzen 5 is running in mid 80s, which is about 15 to 20 degrees hotter than stock. On the other hand, Ryzen 9 is almost reaching 100 degrees, which is about 35 or so degrees hotter than stock. Pretty toasty, but definitely a serious improvement in performance. Before we make our full recommendation, let's compare the results in gaming for both. Starting with CSGO, here with maxed out settings at 4K, we see Ryzen 5 go from worst, if you can call it that, to being the leading chip with 4.5% improvement on average FPS and 3.5% improvement on one percentiles. However, Ryzen 9 has not lost any performance even though its maximum clock speed has been reduced. Next game, which is mostly GPU dependent, is Total War 3 Kingdoms and in both 1080p and 1440p, unfortunately we see no change from overclock on either of the chips. A quick observation here, Ryzen 9 with higher core counts has better one percentile performance while in 1080p overall. Another GPU focused game is Horizon Zero Dawn. Here at 1080p with Ryzen 5, we see 1% improvement on average FPS and 5% improvement on one percentiles. Ryzen 9, even while handicapped, is too fast for the RTX 3090, which is the bottleneck here. Bumping up the settings to 1440p, we see Ryzen 5 with 2% improvement on average FPS, but an impressive 10% improvement on one percentiles. Here, the overclock really makes a difference and actually brings performance closer to Ryzen 9. Also interesting to see that due to the overclock, Ryzen 9 one percentiles have improved by 3%. Lastly, we have Shadow of Tomb Raider and here at 1080p, we see an overclock Ryzen 5 has 3% lower average FPS and 1% lower one percentiles. Ryzen 9 again has 3% improved one percentiles. In 1440p, there is no difference between these CPUs as they are all heavily bottlenecked by the GPU. If you feel like you want to go a step deeper into overclocking, then there are a few other tools at your disposal, starting with overclocking the Infinity Fabric. It is best to keep the ratio between Infinity Fabric, Memory Clock and Memory Speed 1 to 1 to 1. Memory speed that you see on RAM is actually double, as DDR4 is doing two instructions per clock, thus effective speed is half of what is advertised. With this in mind, you might be able to get up to 1900 or even in some cases up to 2000 MHz speed to further up your performance. The last common type of performance tweaking is actually undervolting. This is normally done to reduce temperature, to either deal with the cooling issues, or in situations when you want to make your PC very quiet. This is very common in small form factor PCs, where you're limited by space for high capacity cooling and naturally don't want your PC to sound like a jet plane taking off. This means you'll deliberately be reducing your CPU performance there. So just to summarize it, overclocking on Zen 3, what are we seeing here? 
At the low end with Ryzen 5, when we overclock, we do gain a bit of performance, but the chip already performs really, really well. So unless you need that extra few percent of performance improvement, or you wanna do some productivity tasks without buying higher core count chip, then maybe it makes sense. But if you're purely getting it for gaming, then probably leave it as is and enjoy the very cool and quiet system with already a good enough performance. At the high end for people who require maximum performance, overclocking Ryzen 9 can make sense. And considering the cost, it is likely you can afford a really good cooling system to handle it. Moreover, with the performance the CPU has, the loss of 200 MHz boost clock is actually not noticeable. In fact, due to the all-core overclock, it seems to perform much better in most workloads. So it looks like a win-win. All you need now is some good luck with getting that golden chip. I hope you found this useful. Don't forget to smash that thumbs up and subscribe for more. And we'll see you guys in the next one.